during times that are so anxious. Uh, so each of these days, each of these mornings with you will offer a different resource, a different tool that's been helpful for me. Uh, tomorrow, I'll look forward to sharing with you a resource or a tool called Spiral Dynamics, which is a way of looking at reality and understanding our differences and leading through those conflicts. On Wednesday, I'll be sharing with you uh, John Wesley's uh, way to hold us together, which is through Covenant Renewal. And it is based in large part on the book that Charlie lifted up for you, One Faithful Promise. On Thursday, I'll be pulling it all together, uh, diagnosing these anxious times and giving us words of encouragement uh, in how to lead and how to be faithful. But it all begins this morning with my favorite tool, uh, the resource that has been most personally formative to me uh, since I was introduced to it 25 years ago. Uh, it's called the Enneagram, and it's a personality type indicator, uh, but more than that, it is a spiritual resource, a way for us to be faithful together. What I'd like to do is shift now to my PowerPoint presentation, and hopefully this will work. Um, Greg, can I interrupt you? Yes. Um, it seems like the uh, broadcast is not, is the uh, live stream is not going on. Did you hit the broadcast button? I did. Okay. Okay. The best I could tell, I did. <laughs> is the live stream not working? Okay, okay, we're, we're, we're good. I'm sorry to interrupt, okay. Okay, there's anything I need to do on my end? I don't think so at this moment, no. Okay. Well, I hope folks are following along and listening. Otherwise, Charlie, you're going to get the full brunt <laughs> of this presentation. Well, that'll be all right. I, that'll be all right. Okay. Uh, all right for me. Time. Yes. Yeah. We want everybody else to benefit too, of course. Sure. Uh, there will be a time for questions uh, starting about 9:45, which I understand you all will be able to ask via the chat function. Yes. I look forward to that. Um, I just got the word that we are up and running now. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, uh, I understand that the handout has been made available to you, perhaps uh, um, a hard copy if you're joining together live, uh, but there's also a handout that's available on the Lakeside Chautauqua website. And so if you have any questions about how to access that handout, uh, you can ask Charlie and his team. Uh, that handout is about an eight and a half by 14 spreadsheet with a full view of these different uh, personality styles. Uh, but I want to give you a quick overview for the next 30 minutes of each of these nine styles. The idea of personality, uh, the definition of personality is complex and varied. I'm certainly not a, a licensed psychologist or a PhD in the field. Uh, so my, my easiest thumbnail description of what personality is, is that it is a filter through which we can assess all of the data that is coming to us and ultimately leads us to an ideal or a filter through which we try to make uh, order out of chaos, in a sense, in a way to make the world a better place. The Enneagram suggests that each of us have a primary filter or a primary ideal through which we see the world, see ourselves and see relationships. And it is the pursuit of that one ideal that enables us to make the world a better place. Each of these ideals has a shadow side, just like every strength that we have has a, a limitation. And so the, the really helpful thing for the Enneagram for me is to realize that even all of the strengths that I offer the world have some things that I need to keep in check if I were to go to an extreme. Uh, the Enneagram uh, is rooted in ancient Christian mysticism. It's been around for millennia, uh, but it's recently received uh, a new emergence in uh, the world of Christian spirituality and secular uh, thought over the last several decades. And I was introduced to it in the mid nineties and it has been so helpful to me. Here is the Enneagram symbol. It is the most prominent symbol of the Enneagram. And there you can see that it's a circle that has nine points around it. Uh, now each of these nine points uh, reflects a different personality style. Uh, there's lots of different labels for these nine styles, uh, but the important thing is to recognize that all of us have one of these primary styles. Now, normally when I do a workshop like this, I will have given in advance an online inventory or a way for folks to self-score 
what they think their style is so that they can come into this presentation uh, more interested in one style over another. Uh, but the reality is all of us um, uh, are on a journey to discover what that one style is. And so uh, by the end of our time together, uh, perhaps you will have um, a centering as to which one um, is, is most like you. I'm just going to go through them briefly from one through nine. But what I'd like to uh, offer to you is that if one of these styles most resonates to you, let's say, for example, that by the end of this, you feel like you're a one, a reformer. That will be your primary style, but you will also be informed by the two styles that are on either side. In this case, if you're a one, uh, you will be informed by both the nine, the peacemaker, and the two, the helper, as well as the styles that are connected across the other side of the circle, what we call arrows. In this case, it would be the seven, the adventurer, and four, the artist. This is all to say that while each of us have a primary style that's embedded into us from the beginning, from, from childhood, and will stay with us through the remainder of life, that one style is complemented and informed by four other styles around the circle. So uh, you'll want to figure out not only which one is your primary style, but to discover the four that also help and shape and form you. Uh, I want to let you know that uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on your style. Uh, I'm not even an expert on any style but my own. Uh, but as I've come to discover these different styles and see how they're played out in the people that I work with, the people that I love, the people with whom I have differences, it has been totally transformative for me to understand how to work with people as well as to develop uh, strengths within myself. Uh, I'm gonna jump right to number one uh, and we'll go through this one uh, rather slowly and then it'll pick up as we go through the other eight. Uh, number one is called the reformer. And uh, the one sees the world as in need of improvement uh, it sees the world as wrong and faithless and unrighteous. And the gift that they give to the world is a sense of rightness, of goodness, that if I can be right and if I can be good and if I can move to perfection and if I can reform the, the wrongness in the world, then I will help make the world a better place. So their ideal is rightness or goodness. And they know that the world, when it, when it can be at its best, is a world of perfection and righteousness. They see the world filled with mistakes, um, uh, unholiness, um, and blemish. And if they can just offer their sense of right in a world filled with wrong, uh, they can improve things. Now, I, wanna, I want you to notice with me this leftmost column. We'll start here. Enneagram suggests that the way that we enforce the ideal within one, each of us is that they try to convince themselves uh, that they are fulfilling that ideal. And so this leftmost column is filled with subconscious statements that a one would try to tell herself or himself in order to convince themselves that they're really fulfilling that ideal. So you'll get things like, I'm good, or at least I'm trying to be. I'm right, I'm moral, I'm pious. And you can see the whole list there of qualities that a one will try to convince themselves that they are living into. Where it gets to be fun is that on the rightmost column, uh, they then take all of these other qualities and try to convince themselves that they are not everything on the right-hand side. These are gonna be polar opposites, obviously, the left-hand column and the right-hand column. I am not therefore wrong or incorrect, complacent, mistaken, careless, and so forth. Uh, and for those of you who do discover that you're ones, you'll be able to flesh out both of these lists much more fully, but this gives you sort of a thumbnail sketch. But here's what happens in each of these styles. Uh, the ones will go so far to try to convince themselves that they, they are everything on this list, that they will then project onto everyone else qualities that are on the right-hand list. In other words, uh, ones will then begin to see in other people wrongness, incorrectness, complacency, unlawfulness, rec uh, recklessness, brokenness, all of those things. So they convince themselves that they are filled with the world, uh, filled, that the world is filled with people who are on the right side of the list. 
This is gonna be the case for each of these nine styles. And so the, the one then has a defense mechanism in which they try to convince themselves that they are the right ones, everyone else is wrong, and if they go too far to an extreme with that, then you can see the defense mechanism that's in the center. Judgmentalism, condescension, self-righteousness, and pity. Now this, I don't wanna suggest that there, are negative, that there are only negative qualities here for the one. In fact, we need ones in the world. <laughs> we need ones in our lives, we need them in our churches, we need them in our families. Because they see the world so cut and dry, uh, whenever we, uh, as a family or as a system, uh, enter ambiguity or chaos, we need ones to say, all right, all things considered, this is the way we need to go. Uh, they have been incredibly valuable to us as a society. Uh, and when they offer their strengths of clarity um, and rightness, and they can be incredible leaders. But as we will see with all of these nine styles, when unchecked and if they go to an extreme, they can contribute uh, this defense mechanism, which is relatively unhealthy. So this is all to say that each of these nine styles have their shadow sides, and, uh, and there's no uh, reason to condescend any of these nine styles because we all have those limitations. So that is, that is the one. Uh, you want ones, for example, to proofread your newsletter before it goes out to print because they are very good at noticing mistakes and proofreading. Uh, you want ones uh, in your life when you uh, need to make a tough decision and they will offer you their advice very, very clearly as to what they think. Um, and you also want to know that when you're working with a one, they can be most critical of themselves uh, because they uh, see the faults within them even more so than anybody else. And so you'll want to be gentle with them in offering criticism because often they are their own worst critic. But let me jump to the two. Again, the, the two uh, is, has a, its own ideal and they see the world as needing help. And the way that they can make the world a better place is to offer themselves sacrificially in order to give assistance uh, to people and, and the great ideal that they have is that the, what the world needs is so much more love. Uh, the world is filled with so much hatred and brokenness and woundedness and uh, twos have a kind of sixth sense about how to meet the, the needs of the world. Uh, you can put them in a room and they will gravitate toward the ones who they sense are in need for whatever reason, and they will come up alongside uh, the people who are in need and offer whatever it is of themselves that they can give to help meet the needs of other people. Extremely generous. And they are, uh, they are the ones uh, who, um, who are the first to step up and offer assistance. They will always be the ones saying, is there anything I can do? Uh, can I help you? Uh, what is it that you need? because they convince themselves that they are helpful and generous and needed, empathetic, uh, loving, uh, compassionate, and so forth. And they convince themselves that they are not, therefore, selfish or stingy or self-absorbed or any of those other qualities that are antithetical to the helper. Now, you might uh, see then that if they go so far with this that their defense mechanism becomes a martyr complex. When, when they see themselves, when they define themselves only by their ability to help uh, other people, they, uh, they will repress their own needs and not accept help from other people. And in sort of a subconscious way, they will help people so much that they, um, even though they don't want to be thanked uh, on the outside, uh, they will begin to see themselves as kind of a martyr. Look at everything that I'm doing um, and yet people are not saying thank you. Uh, I have known so many wonderful twos in my life. They are the ones who have come up to me. They've known that I've needed a word of encouragement before I even acknowledge it. Uh, they uh, come and, and offer comfort and encouragement and, and resources and support for me. They're always the first ones to say to me, is there anything I can do to help? But I've also known some unhealthy twos who, uh, who do have that martyrdom complex. And it is, uh, it is uh, something to remind me of that I need to say thank you. And, and I need to 
be open to helping them if they are willing to accept that help. Uh, the three is the performer. The world is filled with inefficiency and failure uh, and all it needs is excellence. It needs a, a better way of functioning. And so the performer is driven by uh, doing well and succeeding and offering that kind of excellence to the world. The performers are high achievers, they're success oriented. Oftentimes their success is contingent on outside metrics like a good report card grade or a, a good review, a good performance review or great critic reviews. Uh, performers are often um, actors, uh, performers, uh, literally performers on the stage. Uh, they're very gifted in communication and in speaking. Um, yeah, I'm a six myself, and we'll figure out what that six means, but because I'm connected to a three, uh, I tap into my three energy whenever I'm preaching uh, because I want to be clear. I want the sermon to be uh, as excellent as possible. And so they will convince themselves of all of these qualities on the left. None of those should be a surprise to you, and neither should there be a surprise on the right-hand side. I am not, therefore, a failure, ineffective, unclear. So imagine these threes, then. All they want to do is be as effective as possible, and subconsciously they convince themselves that they are surrounded by people who are failures, ineffective, unclear, unprepared, aimless. And so the way that they will um, combat that is to keep offering as much excellence and efficiency and high performance and success as they can. These are people who uh, care a lot about how they, perceive, they are perceived. They want to be perceived as successful and responsible and, and trustworthy. And so um, uh, external praise is really important to them. The, the tough thing about being a three is that a three can be so identified with their work that their work then becomes their worth. That they're so dependent on external metrics for success that they cannot see for themselves any worth within them outside of the praise that they get uh, externally. Um, I can share, uh, I would share with you personally that uh, the three is so strong in me that I can remember to this day uh, conversations with my dad uh, when I would come home with a report card filled with A's uh, and A pluses, except for that one A minus that found its uh, way to sneak into my report card. And, uh, and rather than give lots of praise for the A's and A pluses, he would say, well, what happened here in this class with the A minus? And so it would be such an effort on my part to please uh, not only him, but to please the teachers and ultimately please myself that I became so solely identified with uh, that report card that that began to be the way I saw myself. Um, and so that when taken to an extreme, uh, the performer uh, needs to find a sense of value and worth outside of their work and their evaluation of their work by others. That's what this performance identification piece means. But we need threes in our lives. Uh, because if you want a job to get done, you turn it to a three because they will not only do it well, they will do it efficiently. Um, and you, you don't have to micromanage them because they have this own in, their own internal sense of motivation and drive, and they will do very, very well. Um, but you also have to know that threes are struggling on the inside, uh, that their worth equals their work. And so they need to uh, be praised, not just for what they do, but for who they are. Um, and they're, the tough thing that they um, struggle with theologically is the idea of grace, that God loves me just for who I am, not for anything that I've done. Uh, and so threes, threes have those challenges as well. So again, going back to the main diagram, we've covered the one, the two, and the three. Notice that the two is shaped by the one and the three and has those energies associated with it. Um, and that's going to be the case as we go all the way around the circle. Let's move to the four. The four perceives the problem with the world as being one of ugliness and ordinariness. Uh, that it, it needs to be beautified, needs more originality. And so the four's idealization is one of beautification. If I can just make the world a more beautiful place, if I can just find it within me, 
to create something extraordinary. If I can just offer something that stands out against a black, bleak, uh, hopeless canvas, uh, then I can help make the world a better place. And so the artist really works on beauty and originality. Just take a look at all these left-hand attributes, uh, the things that they try to convince themselves that they are, and the things that they are not. And therefore, uh, subconsciously, they project all of these I am not attributes on everyone around them. Uh, I once uh, uh, knew a four who was, and, and still is, she's just a, a beautiful, extraordinary woman. And she feels like it's her job to, um, to create beauty and offer beauty to everyone that she knows. And so for Christmas, uh, she gave me one year a, uh, a handmade uh, cheese tray that had uh, a, a hand-painted picture of Santa Claus on it. And she was just beaming when she gave it to me. Uh, that, that in her mind, it was just so beautiful and extraordinary. And, and the truth be told, it, it was an extraordinarily beautiful piece, much more beautiful than the way I'm describing it. Uh, but <laughs> I was a very young seminarian at the time. Uh, and the idea of owning a cheese tray that would be associated with hosting and dinner parties and those kinds of sort of lavish events was so far outside my capability at the time uh, that I didn't see the functionality of it, uh, which is what a three would say but she saw the beauty in it. And so um, I still have that cheese tray and indeed I have used it. But at the time, what I sensed was that the gift that she was giving me was not the functionality of the gift, but the beauty of the gift. And uh, that helped me appreciate that gift even more. Um, we need artists in our lives. We need artists to be able to interpret the pain and the brokenness of the world through extraordinary and beautiful ways but often they can become so lost in their art uh, that they, um, and that, that they could seek extraordinary uh, amid the ordinary, that they could get lost in their efforts to beautify the world. And that's what uh, artistic sublimation and interjection um, is, uh, gives you an idea of. Then we have the fives. For a long time, I thought I was a five uh, because I'm a six uh, and I'm connected to a five. Uh, I thought for a long time that I was a five. Fives use their brains. They see the world as a mystery that needs to be uh, solved. They see the world as a, 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 a code that needs to be cracked. That the problem with the world is that there's so much unknown, uh, so much foolishness. And what the world needs is a lot more wisdom, a lot more insight, someone or people to help figure out the mysteries of the cosmos. And so they use their brains and their insights to help uh, fix that. And the way they do that is they, they try to assume sort of an objective distance from, uh, from reality so that they could ob just observe it and try to make connections and gain insights in a way that others can't. So when you have a five that's in a, for example, a conference room and you're having a meeting, Fives will often be the ones that will be physically sitting distant from everybody else from the table and they'll just be turning and observing and they won't be saying anything because in their minds, uh, they're just processing and trying to make connections and try to find that one insight uh, that when everybody else has spoken, they'll turn to that five like ascending the mountain to seek um, wisdom from the sacred sage and then that five will then speak finally and offer what they hope or believe is the one insight that will just get the entire room to go, oh, or wow. I mean, fives live on that kind of thing. So fives will try to convince themselves that they're everything on the left-hand side, that they are not anything on the right-hand side. And when they go to an extreme, they will see right-hand qualities in everybody else. Uh, fives live in the world of knowledge. Um, if, if, you're ever, if people ever want to try to find me and I'm not at home or in the office, more than likely I'll be in a bookstore um, because I love to engage the world of ideas. And for a while I was one of those people that would just sit distant from everybody else and I wouldn't say anything. And people could perceive a five as being aloof or disengaged, but in reality, they, they, their minds are going a mile a minute 
and they're looking for that, that insight that can help uh, really crack the code for people. This certainly informs my preaching uh, when I tap into my five. Um, I love aha moments in my sermons, uh, and I love it when people have that light bulb that goes off in their minds as well. But in an unhealthy state, when gone to an extreme, a five can, can withdraw because their posture is one of objectivity and disengagement so that they can get a good full view of what's happening. Uh, they can withdraw um, uh, emotionally, uh, physically withdraw. Uh, they're not the quickest to offer uh, their emotions or to unpack their heart. And so fives really need to work on getting outside their head and tapping into their hearts. Um, and in an unhealthy state, they can hoard their knowledge or their wisdom. Um, the ideal is to share that wisdom with, with other people. But in an extreme, they will hold on to that wisdom because they know that as long as they have the wisdom, that means other people don't. And that will reinforce the idea of people being on the right-hand side. Uh, fives are some of our most brilliant comedians. Um, comedians have this way of taking an objective look at reality, especially the, the observational comics, and they will make uh, connections uh, among different concepts and, and realities that none of us have, have, have ever thought of. And that is really at the heart of com comedy in some ways or humor is making absurd connections when other people don't. So some of our smartest, some of our most brilliant comics are fives uh, just because of their ability to think. We need fives in the world uh, because they're out ahead of us thinking about things and making connections. And I think all of us have known uh, fives in our, in our lives. Um, before I go too much further, uh, because this is such a quick overview of the Enneagram, I wanna let you know that there's just a vast uh, field of resources for you to discover more about each of these styles, how to relate to them, um, how to appreciate them, um, and how to overcome the limitations within each of us as we discover our styles. I also want to suggest to you, uh, and this was really the crystallizing thing for me in the Enneagram, is that the way to become healthier in your own style is to learn to embrace everything on the right-hand side within you. Rather than try to uh, repress these things on the right-hand side, rather than try to externalize them into other people, it's to begin to acknowledge each of these realities within you and embrace them. Uh, as one therapist once told me, um, to, to dance with your shadow. What would it look like for a five to embrace foolishness or for a one to embrace the mistakes that they're making as opportunities to get better? What would it be for a two to acknowledge that they themselves need help? That would be a, an important and healthy move. What would it be for a three to embrace failure as an opportunity to learn from it? What would it be like for a four to embrace ordinariness or ugliness? That's what we have to do with each of these styles. And that is clearly what I learned when I discovered ultimately and finally that I'm a six. This is really the only style that I'm an expert of because I've discovered uh, the six style within myself rather reluctantly because the six, the ultimate shadow for the six is fear. It's this idea that the world is filled with chaos and threats that are looming and that if we only could abide by the rules and if only we could do what uh, is important to do, and if we all just did that, and if we were all just loyal to each other, we could create order out of that chaos um, and a sense of teamwork and camaraderie uh, and obedience is, is what's going to overcome, uh, overcome it. Uh, it is uh, the, the reason that I finally discovered that I'm a six rather than a three or a five is that I ultimately realized that the big thing that I'm trying to avoid in my life is not just failure, which is the three, or foolishness or, or ignorance, which is the five. Uh, I'm really driven by fear. <laughs> and uh, the fear driven, uh, and what that means is being able to forecast the worst case scenario in my mind and being almost paralyzed with the possibilities of how badly things can go then that's really a characteristic of the six. 
Um, I try to be all of these things on the left-hand side, prepared, cautious, a rule keeper. Loyalty is a high quality for me. And I try to avoid all of these things because I never want to get caught in a situation where the threats are so big that I find myself unprepared. My favorite personal illustration of this is that um, uh, one time my, my older daughter and I were watching Mythbusters, uh, a show that tries to uh, dispel um, uh, common uh, uh, ideas and, and give uh, with science and, and all of that. And they were asking the question, uh, what do you do when your car is submerged in a body of water? If you happen to find yourself driving off and into a lake or something, and they were dispelling all sorts of ideas that people thought were effective, like rolling down the window or trying to open up the car door. And they discovered that if you ever find yourself in a car submerged, the best thing to have is one of those uh, window hammers, uh, one of those car window hammers that you pull out of the glove compartment and you just, you, you break the window in that precise point that makes the window shatter and then you're able to swim out uh, to safety. We watched that episode. My daughter, who's also a six, turned to me and said, we need one of those. And I said, yeah, we do. <laughs> and so the very next day I went to the auto parts store, bought a window hammer and knew that I was prepared for that moment uh, when, when a car that I was driving uh, fell into a body of water. Uh, I was living in Iowa at the time, thousands of miles from either ocean, where the only body of water in that small town was a creek that at best was just a few feet deep, um, but I needed that window hammer um, in, my, in my glove compartment um, in order to be prepared for the worst case scenario. Uh, that's how sixes operate. They forecast, uh, they, they try to avoid fear as much as possible, and they try to uh, do what uh, authority expects of them because if they don't, they're fearful that authority will come down on them. And so a defense mechanism for a six is that they lose their own sense of self-authority, that they lose um, the ability to hope. Hope is a, a hard thing for a six. And that they are only trying to placate authority the best they can. Uh, that is, uh, that's been a, a shadow side for me for a long time, but I offer strengths. Six off, sixes offer strengths of a strong sense of teamwork, a strong sense of camaraderie, of all of us agreeing on the rules together and fostering the sense in which we all come together along the same uh, agreed principles. Uh, that's the way I try to lead um, as a leader um, uh, of my local church. And so we need sixes in our lives because they are so loyal and faithful, but they also can be driven by fear. Uh, the sevens, are driven by a sense of wanting to escape the pain of the world by, ex by experiencing joy. Uh, they will fill their lives with joyful experiences and adventures with delights. Uh, they are the ones that you want to plan a party with because they will fill it with so many wonderful, delightful experiences because they believe that because the world is filled with pain, they want to just make it a more pleasurable, happier, adventurous place. They love options. They will run a mile a minute trying to come up with all sorts of things for people to do and for them to do. And so uh, they don't like to be locked in. Uh, oftentimes their work style is one where they just want to have every day be a different kind of day. Uh, they don't usually make a desk job nine to five confined in a cubicle kinds of employees. They want every, every day, every hour to be different. They certainly suffer from what's called FOMO, fear of missing out. That's a, cop, that's a popular phrase nowadays. Uh, and so they, they're, they're optimists, they're generalists. Uh, I have the word Tigger here because um, each of the Winnie the Pooh characters exhibits uh, one of the nine styles and certainly the seven is most like, like the Tigger. Uh, and they therefore try to avoid all of these I am not qualities to the point where when taken to an extreme, a seven will uh, seek anything necessary to escape the pain. And that's what this phrase narcotization means, that oftentimes they will turn to unhealthy practices 
uh, when taken to an extreme, they will turn to substances or addictions in order to escape the pain. So again, well, what would a seven do in order to become as healthy a seven as possible? Learn to embrace the pain. Learn to acknowledge limitations. Uh, try to be in a routine as best as they can, rather than always looking for the next best thing. We certainly need sevens in our lives. Um, as I've done the Enneagram with so many church staffs over the year, I've discovered that every staff has a fair collection of sevens in their lives. Often they're involved in youth ministry uh, because they want to create experiences, joyful uh, experiences for, for the youth. Um, but we need them in our lives um, and we need them in our staffs and in our work environments. All right, an eight is an extremely, extremely energized, energetic personality style. It's called the leader. They see the problem with the world is that it is filled with weakness and oppression and injustice. And there they see it within themselves to make the world a better place by leading, by empowering people, by giving voice to the voiceless. So they have this amazing self-generating capacity of tapping into an inexhaustible sense of power. Uh, they see the world as having either power or being filled with powerless, powerlessness. And they see it within themselves to offer their own power to the world and in a healthy sense, empower other people. Uh, I've known so many eights in, in my life. I have eights on my staff. And you can, you can sense an eight when they walk into a room because they just have this sense about them that they, that they, are, that they are powerful. Um, and they will automatically be drawn to other power people in the room. They kind of have that sixth sense about them that they will go to a, 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 a group in the room that they sense has the power or a more powerful person, and they will um, engage that person. The eights that I've known have, um, have even subconsciously turned it into a game where they say to themselves, you know, I will go to another powerful person and I will try to take them down a notch uh, just because for them, it's not necessarily um, a vindictive thing or a judgmental thing, but that kind of power game is something that they really, they really thrive on, uh, taking people down a notch just so that they can uh, reinforce their own uh, self sense of empowerment. You can see, by the way, why the eight and the two is connected. So we're back here to the eight, the leader, Notice that this arrow connects them to the two, the helper. When in a healthy state, an eight will use their power to address the needs of other people. That also, by the way, can make the eight also susceptible to the martyrdom complex, which is also a facet of the two, that they can give of themselves and offer their power to such a degree that they uh, feel a, a martyr uh, for everything that they're giving. Eights will try to avoid weakness. The eights that I've known have a hard time vocalizing the weakness in their life. And so whenever an eight admits that they are, that they're helpless or that they're weak, that's actually something to be praised. Uh, thank you, I would say, for being so vulnerable with me. Because that's an important thing for an eight to, to have to learn in order to be as healthy as possible. The last thing I want to get to, and then I'll get to questions, is the nine. This one's fairly straightforward. The nine sees the world as filled with conflict and it's up to the nine to offer peace, balance and harmony in, in the world. The nines are um, some extraordinary people who can see conflict and they can understand both sides of the conflict and they will try to forge a, a, a new way, a, a way of making peace between these polarized conflicts. It also means that they try to avoid conflict within themselves, that they try to be as settled and centered and conflict-free as possible to where whenever there's a sense of conflict within them, an unhealthy nine will try to avoid their inner conflict. Um, in a practical sense, nines tend to be procrastinators because when there's the harshness of a deadline that's looming, that's coming up, uh, a nine will try to put off resolving uh, that conflict uh, as much as possible, which means oftentimes waiting until the last minute in order to get something done. 
uh, that's an unhealthy nine. But we need nines in our lives because they offer peace in the world. And they are just in touch with the balance and the harmony that's in nature. And they, uh, they have a sixth sense about conflict. Um, some of our most beautiful pastors and writers and spiritual guides are nines. And uh, I w- notice real quick where the nines are situated. Nines are situated between the eights and the ones, two of the strongest energies in the, on the Enneagram. So if you have a strong eight and a strong one uh, in your life, then uh, they can come together by tapping into their mutual nine energy and noticing that both of these uh, styles have their strengths and that they could just come together to make peace then they could, uh, they could resolve conflict and find the best of what they offer. So the final thing I want to do is just go back to the diagram here. Uh, hopefully, as you discover the Enneagram for yourself, you will not only discover your primary style, but see how it's informed by the ones that are on either side of it, as well as the ones that are connected by arrows on the other side. I want to reiterate that each of these styles has their strengths and their shadow sides. And the way to become healthy is by embracing that shadow side, by tearing down the wall that would separate the I am from the I am not and making this wall permeable rather than rigid. Uh, And that means addressing your defense mechanism so that there can be much more fluidity between these two lists. That's the way to become um, uh, healthier. It means for me as a six, embracing my fears and not being overcome or paralyzed by them. It means as a nine, embracing conflict, embracing weakness as an eight, embracing pain as a seven, embracing fear, embracing ignorance, embracing ugliness, embracing failure, embracing uh, need, and embracing mistakes. So uh, there's so much to live into with this Enneagram. I've, I've done a, a very quick overview and probably forgotten to say many things, uh, but I hope if you're unfamiliar with the Enneagram, it gives you just enough of a taste to explore it on your own. Uh, and again, there's so many books and resources on the web that you can, uh, that you can tap into. So um, it is now 948 and I do want to allow time to ask questions. What I'll do is I'll stop sharing at this time. And if you have any questions, I forgot to offer this, you can certainly type them into the chat if you would like, uh, or if there's another way to ask those questions uh, via video or audio, we can receive those. So let me stop there, take a drink, and see uh, if there are any questions or comments from anybody. And welcome back, Charlie, I see you back on the screen. Thank you, McGray. Yeah, it's, um, I'm just trying to figure out where I am on the chart. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I found it interesting uh, and challenging that you're saying to embrace the uh, negative mm-hmm. aspects. And um, maybe you can say a little more about that. We were often told to play to strengths, you know, and, and kind of ignore or uh, minimize the things that we're not good at or the areas that we have difficulty with. Can you say a little more about that? Sure. There's a, there's a great psychological term called enantiodromia. Um, it's a long, complicated word. It simply means that um, if, if you go t- too far to one extreme or pursue something with such an extreme, you actually become the opposite of that which you are pursuing. Mm-hmm. Um, for an example, a person who values wisdom, a five, for example, could be so focused on becoming knowledgeable about a topic that they could actually become ignorant about other things. A person who's so driven by success and achievement could actually become a failure in other areas of their life, failure in their family or failure in their Mm -hmm. relationships. Um, uh, A person who is so driven um, by by, uh, loyalty, a six, could actually become more fearful about other things. So anantiodromia suggests that in order to prevent becoming the very opposite of that which you are pursuing, that you actually learn to embrace those shadows and allow for um, negative aspects of your life that you're trying to repress or ignore and turn them into opportunities for learning. Um, That's a really hard task 
because by the time we become aware of these shadow sides, they're so ingrained in us. And that's why um, reflection, um, personal work uh, in, in matters of faith, it means uh, prayer, meditation, um, certainly therapy. Uh, I've been mm -hmm. the benefit of a lot of great therapists who have helped me uh, name my shadows and embrace them. That's all part of the inner work that's necessary um, uh, in order to become healthy. So uh, there's a question here. Thank you for typing that in. I have no trouble seeing the numbers. I am not, <laughs> but I have a hard time identifying my primary number. Of course, yeah. It could be any one of four or five of them. What does the primary uh, association with multiple numbers imply? That's great. Um, for people, certainly for me, it was uh, a few years journey for me to discover what my primary, my primary style was. I first thought I was a three because I wanted to see myself as successful and achieving. Then I saw myself as a five because I wanted to think of myself as wise and intelligent and all that. I finally discovered that I was a six because of, the, of what I was trying to avoid. And this would be the, the advice uh, that I would give anybody who's struggling. What is the negative that you, that you are trying to avoid the most? Is it failure? In which case it would be a three. That was what for me. Is it ignorance? In which case it would be a five. Or was I really trying to avoid fear? What's my big motivator? And I discovered that fear for me was the biggest motivator uh, of the worst case scenario happening. So as, as you're uh, trying to figure out, uh, Danny, what your primary style would be, not only is it a question of what ideal are you most attracted to, but also what is it that you're most trying to avoid in your life? Uh, and that might be helpful as well. I would also say, just as a reminder, that um, it's not a surprise for you to have affinity with four uh, of those styles. Because again, each of our primary styles is connected either by wings or arrows to four other styles on the Enneagram, to the two that are on the other side of you and to the two that are on the other side um, by arrow. And so just take a look at the diagram would be another thing that I would suggest. Which one of those styles of the four is connected to the other three? And that might be your primary style. Um, and knowing that you're, you're, we are all informed by, by four others. So. Thank you for the question. This is all uh, f fairly uh, esoteric when you first get into it. It's kind of a hard thing, but I, hopefully what people can see as they really get into the Enneagram is how it helps us understand our differences and appreciate everyone's strengths and helps us grow from our weaknesses. The important caveat that I would offer is that we'd be careful not to use the Enneagram or any personality inventory like Myers-Briggs or any of them as, a, as a simply a labeler on other people mm -hmm. or a box that we put people into that confines them um, and that it creates kind of a, a stereotype, a stereotypical way of looking at other people. I have to check myself on that all the time, that even though I've, I've led my staff in discovering the Enneagram and led many, many groups in this, we have to be careful not to see people simply through uh, their, their number or their style, that we are all human beings, that we're all complex, and uh, that we all uh, deserve more than just the labels that we give people to. And the, other, the, the only other thing that I would offer um, is that in the person of Jesus, we remember that all nine styles are most fully expressed. I think we can hopefully see how all nine ideals are expressed in the person of Jesus, who's the only person to ever live to not have one primary style. Um, he fully represents all nine because he's fully human um, in, in sort of Christian, Christian terminology. And the good news in that is that we can turn to Jesus uh, to see the, most, the, the fullest reflection of our personality style, uh, biblically and theologically. I don't know if there are any other questions or 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 in or comments or insights. I guess I hear you saying, uh, Gray, that we, this is more of a tool for uh, understanding ourselves than for labeling other people. Is that right? So we shouldn't go around to oh, you're a you're a nine, you're an eight, right. you're a six, but try to look in and see what 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 are we and 
where, where do we need to grow? Is that what you're? I, I think it's a both and for sure. Okay. Uh, I think before we can begin to use it in our relationships, we need to uh, wrestle with it ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And when, when you become fully uh, understanding of your own style, that means acknowledging your, your limitations and embracing your shadows. And yes, eventually it can be very helpful to strengthen marriages. I've used this in, in premarital counseling. I've used it, as I said, in staff training. Um, as long as everybody is willing to do the hard inner work of, of acknowledging their strengths and their shadows, it can be just an incredibly fortifying, uh, team-building, um, relationship-enhancing tool when everybody is uh, acknowledging their strengths and their weaknesses. I find it to be very, very helpful. I really um, appreciate Yeah. This what, what, so you want to repeat what you have for us for tomorrow so we can yeah. anticipate? So the, the, the Enneagram has been the most formative tool for me in terms of my own personal development and relationship building. The tool tomorrow, I would say, ranks up there with the Enneagram in terms of a way of viewing reality and the differences that people have. Uh, it's called spiral dynamics. It, rather than coming from the world of psychology like the Enneagram does, this one comes from the world of anthropology. <laughs> In 45 minutes, we're gonna cover um, 250,000 years of human history. And we're going to see how the consciousness of human beings has uh, evolved over time and how those developments are still at work in, our, in the way we see reality. And it will be a tool, hopefully by the end of it, where you'll be able to see why people are so polarized, why they're so ideologically divided, how people in our congregations can see one topic in such different ways, how we can take a look at this, uh, a single piece of scripture and come to so many different conclusions and how it's at work in our politics, in our church debates, uh, in our family discussions, and help us to see, um, again, how there is beauty and strength as well as limitation in each of these perspectives. So um, I found Spiral Dynamics to be just as helpful to me recently as, as the Enneagram. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll all look forward to that. And again, if you don't have a handout, they're available in the administration building today and at Chautauqua Hall tomorrow morning as you come in or of course online, you can download them uh, from any of our different venues, YouTube, uh, web, uh, YouTube, Facebook Live and the Lakeside website. Again, we are with Dr. McGray uh, De Vega from Tampa, Florida. We, we are happy to have you and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning, McGray. God bless you as you uh, minister there in Tampa today, and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you all. Have a blessed day. Thank you.